Diagnosing ADHD is, is one of the controversies in psychiatry, and there are, are, are very well-read and well-researched people who have the identity. Part of a debate, it's part of a push-pull debate, and as a you know, as a profession, interacting with society, we need to sort of move forward and come up with our best answers. You know, there's definitely been times when pendulums have swung too far and too far. The other one is childhood bipolar disorder, which is being revamped for DSM-5, which is coming out in 2013. Um, in the early 90s, we had a little bit of a lift on that sort of repressed memory stuff, um, and that has sort of swung back. So my point is not psychiatry is perfect, um, and, and the, the, the process of diagnosis and understanding conditions it is, is flawed. It's probably the best we have. Is it, is it, does it need more work? Are we sort of on the move? I hope so. Chemical imbalance, the, the, the monoamine theory, I mean, essentially the, your brain is made up of a billion, 100 billion neurons, and they all have to communicate with one another. And, you know, that slide I showed of the synapse, which is where the, you know, the chemical messengers go across the neurotransmitters from one cell to the other. I mean, we all sort of understand that. Chemical imbalance theory is like, if you have too much of something or not enough something in that synapse, then that gives rise to the problem. That sort of morphed into what the, what those neurotransmitters actually do to the receptors on the far cell. So it's not so much the amount of stuff in the synapse, it's how that stuff is affecting the, uh, the, the postsynaptic receptor. And that has a lot to do with then making changes in the postsynaptic cell and downstream in terms of turning certain genes on and certain genes off, uh, giving rise to other substances that can sort of actually literally physically sculpt the central nervous system. Um, we're dealing a lot more with sort of tracks in the brain and how one part of the brain communicates to the other. We're also talking about how our experiences uh, actually get coded into our central nervous system. And the question about PTSD is a really good one because in PTSD we've seen that you know that we are subject to trauma, um, severe trauma, especially over time, especially when we're young, parts of our brain actually do not physically develop um, in, the, in the appropriate way. And, um, you know, so we measure like hippocampal volumes and things like that. So it's, it's a lot more complex than that. Um, right. um, it was, it was uh, sort of used a little bit in 1908, a little bit in the 20s. Um, so the word was around, and it simply meant then a lasting memory trace. Hubbard will talk to you until he's blue in the face that an engram is not a memory. The neat thing about engrams, and this is, this is not published a lot, but there is a psychiatric textbook um, published in 1947 called The Engrams of Psychiatry, and it was spelled E-N-G-R-A-M-M-E-S. And it was actually probably one of the first biological psychiatry textbooks ever published. And Hubbard would likely have seen it, and there's certainly some parallels between how this textbook discusses the engram concept and what Hubbard took from it. And that's one of the one of the origins of things that, that you will not see in, in press very much. Um, after that, after 1947, it's been Hubbard's all the way, no one uses it. Narcissistic personality disorder was so was so profound and, and severe that he ended up sort of believing a lot of it. Um, not because he was psychotic. I do not think he was psychotic. I do not think he was hallucinating or fully delusional. I think. 
was almost like, well, because I'm saying it, therefore it's a good thing to believe and talk about. Um, so he was on the cusp, but I do not think he was crazy. Your question is going to demand getting into the entire mind-brain conundrum, which I think you skeptics are kind of uh, interested in. I don't, I don't have time to, to, to do that, but I mean, there's what is brain, what is mind, uh, what is body? Um, you know, what is, you know, at some point, is there anything that we experience that goes on that, that does not conform to the laws and the rules of basic physics, i.e. a spirit or an immortal soul um, or an essence uh, that is beyond the, the laws of physics, which is beyond the central nervous system or not? I don't know the answer to any of those questions. Um, but is it necessary to know that answer in order to have some, I mean, there are some things as a, you deal with as a psychiatrist and some things you don't deal with. So you make a distinction based on something, I guess. I think if it's, if, if it's coming, if, if there's an issue that's coming out at you uh, as though it's an issue of faith or, or religion or meaning, um, a psychiatrist you know, in psychotherapy can sort of help you kind of work with that. But I think there's ultimately some spots where um, someone wants to go to a more you know, religiously based or spiritually based thing, if that's their thing. Um, most psychiatrists in, in, the, in the here and now right now would, would basically consider um, most of the illnesses to be, to be brain-based illnesses. That doesn't mean that the meanings or the suffering are purely based on molecular phenomena. And I think we have to be aware that, that we don't sort of uh, sign off on that too soon. Um, just, just in responding to your question, um, I, I can't help but reflect back to you that, that one of the conditions of psychiatry that has virtually the greatest evidence for, for genetic uh, susceptibilities is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. ADHD is more heritable than schizophrenia, and in many studies it is as heritable or more heritable than height. Wow. 